and welcome to today's webinar, BAS and CMS Integration, Making Your Smart Building Smarter, Part 2 with Harry Koval and Bob Allen. Before I introduce today's presenters, I'd like to remind you that there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. Should we run out of time, we'll answer your questions directly via email. You'll also receive an email after the webinar containing the link for Part 1 and Part 2 because this is a three-part series. Now a brief introduction to today's presenters. I'd like to introduce Harry Koval, the Vice President of Business Development. He joined Eagle Technology as Director of Sales and Marketing in 2006. Harry has 53 years of experience in information technology and security within healthcare, manufacturing, and service industries. Bob Allen, Lead Green Associate is the Global Business Development Manager for Intelligent Buildings and Strategic Alliance for the Siemens Company. Bob has over 15 years in the IT industry helping customers optimize and integrate their buildings. Recently, Bob was appointed as the Vice Chair of Continental Automated Building Association, CABAP, Intelligent Building Council. Okay, Bob, it's over to you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everyone who's taking the time out of their day to uh, join us today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about building automation systems and why they're important to your building. Um, as we take a look at that, uh, the first question is, you know, what is a building automation system? Uh, we've all heard the term BAS, building automation system, and we've also heard interchangeable terms like integration platform uh, and so on. And basically, we're talking about a software package that is really the anchor of your building. Uh, it's a system that interconnects all of the different systems within that building, and you'll see some of the systems listed there can be uh, components like your HVAC system, lighting systems, power generators, security videos, different uh, alarms, life safety, access control, and uh, CCTV, and many more other systems and applications in your building. It's that first step in how we integrate a building. Without having that platform in place which we can tie all these systems in together, uh, we don't have that ability to basically share data. I think what's very interesting about uh, what we're talking about today is how it all ties into data. And I'm very often asked, what, what is an intelligent building? And if we went around the room and asked everyone on the line, and, and Harry and myself, um, even though we're all in that industry or, or close to it, we probably have different definitions and we have different ways of, of what we perceive to be a, uh, an intelligent building. So for the sake of my discussion today, what I consider it to be is a building where each of the individual systems within that building can optimize their own performance based on the information gathered by all of the systems. The only way to do that is having a shared database. And that BAS, that integration platform, uh, allows us to uh, store that data in a way that all the systems can then share and work from. Uh, I've been in building integration and systems, uh, building optimization and so on for uh, quite a few years now. And I'll tell you something that's changed dramatically over the years is the economic model of an intelligent building. And what I mean by that is three or four years ago, if, I, if you were building a, a new project and, and I came to you and said, hey, you know, we should look at building an intelligent building because there are all these magnificent benefits to that, the conversation would sound a little like this, that, hey, you should build an intelligent building. We can do that for you. Uh, but it's going to cost X plus 10% to build that building. There's that ROI model, that 10% you'll make back over the next few years uh, through energy reduction, uh, changing your processes to become more efficient, uh, productivity, and so on. But now, what I consider to be the economic pendulum has swung in the other direction where we can actually build that building for less. So the conversation says, hey, you're going to build a building for X. We can do it for X minus 10%. And oh, by the way, still have all these operational efficiencies, lower energy, and so on. Here's an example of a, a project that, uh, that I'm currently involved in where we talk to the customer about uh, what, they're in, what they're putting for systems in their building today. And we knew right off the bat they had HVAC, lighting, uh, generators, UPS, elevators, access control, utility meters, and life safety. We even identified some other systems within that building that can also be integrated on the building automation system if they choose to, uh, to deploy those systems. And when we looked at that, uh, we were able to come up with uh, almost 300,000 in, or I'm sorry, uh, 480,000 in savings for that, uh, for that project. We reduced their controls first cost in by 38%. 
At the same time, we're able to optimize their building performance, um, maximize their occupant productivity through different control strategies, certainly reduce their utility consumption, um, reduce overall operating expenses, uh, give them that reliability uh, and redundancy within the systems. We're lowering their risk and we're helping them to be able to manage their building uh, considerably better than they would in a traditional environment. As a matter of fact, if you're in a traditional type uh, of a building construction mode, you'll see here that uh, each of those building graphics has some of the common systems within a building, and each one rides on its own separate infrastructure and comes down into its own control box. A lot of uh, you know, a lot of detriments to designing your building that way. Can you do it? Well, sure. We have buildings that have been around for hundreds of years before we had uh, integration platforms, and yes, they're functioning. But fact of the matter is, there's just a better way. Um, when we have this type of siloed environment, then we have different types of interfaces, different types of network, different uh, communication protocols where they're not speaking the same language, different power types, different uh, actual cable types to connect to all these different systems. Gives you a higher initial cost, lose a lot of uh, economy of scale there. Uh, the fact that each of the interfaces is purchased separately or using a, a different software for each of these systems, one, makes it expensive on the procurement side, but also makes it difficult on the training side and the ongoing operations where uh, people have to be specialized in each of those systems just to understand the, uh, the software side of it. Certainly when you expand that portfolio from one building to multiple buildings, uh, the degree of difficulty uh, goes up exponentially with trying to understand the energy demands of your portfolio, understand what uh, buildings are working better than others and how you can replicate that, uh, that type of success. Also limits uh, the ability for buildings to communicate with each other. Uh, maintenance is a lot more expensive. We end up having truck rolls more often than, uh, than probably necessary. Uh, all leading to uh, the length of time to diagnose problems. Some of the other issues that we see in, in our traditional buildings, um, again, having those different power supplies, infrastructure, and so on, uh, multiple networks to perform the same systems. Uh, and I, I have the word redundant in the slide, but I don't like to use that word only because uh, redundant replies a ba implies that it's a backup, but it's really not. We're using multiple systems to perform the same tasks when we could be leveraging uh, the same assets within the building. And it does make it very challenging for our IT department. But I think one of the, the biggest drawbacks to that traditional system is the ability to get data. When we have all of these systems that are talking different languages, uh, the ability to pool that data together and share that with other systems is very expensive. We can do it. We can do it in legacy buildings and things like that, but the cost goes up. And um, the analogy I like to use is I could take this presentation and I could go present to um, the uh, Congress in Washington, D.C., relatively inexpensive presentation. Uh, they may not like or they may like what I have to say, but they'd understand it very easily. If I were to take the same presentation and go to UN, it's a much more expensive presentation. We now have to translate it to people who don't speak English. Uh, we lose the value of that data because things that I say do not translate directly into other languages. Uh, so a, a lot of drawbacks there in the ability to, uh, to make that information accessible to all the different systems in a, a manageable and, and really optimum type way. When we have that uh, traditional type building, our networks tend to look like this. And the, uh, the key takeaway here is each of those horizontal colored lines represents that different communication, that different c cable type, different power. And what you'll really notice is my dots of information are only going from their own system, whether it's CCTV or lighting, to their own control software back down to that individual system. The data is not being shared throughout the different systems. When we look at intelligent buildings, the three things that, I, that I'd like you to consider is, one, rethinking the way that you design, the way you procure, and the way you deploy your buildings. Uh, the building to the left is just another graphical representation, as we saw earlier, of all the systems on their own proprietary networks down into their own proprietary software. What we're suggesting is that building to the right, and it starts with a single unified IP infrastructure. That's where the Siemens company comes in. We manufacture high-quality infrastructure, your Category 5, 6, 7, fiber, and all the associated passive layer there. Uh, it takes a different means of procuring. So typically when you, uh, when you put specification documents on the street for an intelligent building, uh, you would, uh, say, put the cameras out there with the, the camera models and so on, and within that would be a cable portion. And what happens is the camera companies typically don't install cables, so what they'll do is they'll subcontract that. 
And when they do, if you multiply that times all the different technologies out there, uh, they, you can't guarantee they're going to sub that to the main cable installer on the job. So you may have all of these uh, extra subcontractors that we don't need. We can eliminate the subs by taking all of that infrastructure and pulling it back into its own specification, um, giving you that one throat to choke model in the infrastructure. Now the camera or the card access teams, they can do what they do best. There'll be a service loop waiting for them and so on. The other big change is specifying the integration platform up front, that building automation system. And one thing I'll suggest is rather than doing our traditional RFP request for proposal or price, doing an RFQ or request for qualifications where you're interviewing that platform up front and developing a relationship with them and a lot of times um, they'll do open book pricing because by specifying them up front we don't know what this system is going to cost so it gives you that level playing field. But having that in place now gives you the ability to specify all of the edge devices to be compatible to that integration platform. So we're not telling you the manufacturer that you need to use for your edge device. What we're saying is whichever manufacturer you choose or responds to that RFP needs to comply with these specific communication protocols that are generally open so that we have no proprietary systems. Um, and by doing that, we eliminate the need to have to buy their proprietary software. All of that can be done at the integration platform level. What's made this possible is some changes in the industry. Uh, all the systems within the building are now collapsing down onto the network. We had our phones that came down late 90s, early 2000s. Coax uh, we came off of that with cameras. BACnet became BACnet IP. Uh, now we have lighting. With lighting came sensors and ventilation equipment. And this has been the real game changer in uh, the construction industry and the way we're looking at buildings and building analytics. Lighting is no longer about lights. <clears throat> when we look at IP lighting or digital lighting, it is now creating a sensor network throughout the building. Lighting is our most dense application in a building. And with that sensor network, it is collecting the data that all these other systems need to optimize their performance. So creating that digital building gives us a platform through the lighting system to um, be able to have that data to analyze, to manipulate, to create our sequence of events, and so on. The other significance about lighting dropping down onto the network is it's the last major system in the network, we can, or in the building. We can now design a complete IP building from top to bottom. When we do that, our networks look more like this. There's that single unified IP infrastructure based on structured cabling, that blue line across, and now you'll notice my dots of information are going everywhere. Um, the BMS represents, um, or the BAS represents that integration platform, but the information is being shared with all the different systems within that, uh, that building. Giving us that single converged IT network, at economy of scale, it's, it's a less costly infrastructure than our traditional line voltage. In a lot of cases, we're eliminating two different types of infrastructures. Gives us easy expandability. Also for our multinational firms, it allows us to replicate buildings anywhere around the world <clears throat> to a degree that we have not been able to replicate in the past. Gives us a platform for analytics and gives us actionable alarms uh, in, within our system. We also can reduce our installation time, cost of infrastructure and training, moves, ads, and changes are, are much less costly, and even though we're sharing network resources, we can still uh, offer unique services to the different departments. But by far, the biggest value, other than the lower capital costs to construct of an intelligent building, is the ability to collect and analyze facility usage data through IP-enabled sensors. And we're going to talk more about that later, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. And the best part is, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about capital savings here. The best part is you really don't even need to believe what I have to say. The, we design buildings for a reason. We can determine up front what the savings for your building will be before you dig a hole in the ground. When we have that single unified infrastructure in place, we can leverage power over Ethernet for incredible savings. As a matter of fact, the North America average for deploying line voltage or AC power to an edge device is about $1,000. Within that, we have a circuit breaker, a panel, a transformer, AC cable, conduit, junction box, electrician, whole nine yards. We can deliver a power over Ethernet category cable drop to that same location for about $250. That's figuring about $100 for a power over Ethernet port in the telecommunications room and about $150 for an open air Cat 5e drop. So every time we leverage power over Ethernet on this infrastructure, we're saving about $750. Things that we may not be doing now, access control, computer systems, uh, the bulk VAV controllers through building automation systems, uh, actual PoE computers. I have a, a, I have a PoE computer on my desk with a 22-inch monitor running Windows 10, and the only connection to the building is that land drop at my desktop. Time and attendance machines, battery chargers for phones and PDAs, uh, all kinds of great, basically everything this side of our major, uh, our major components can be 
have a Power over Ethernet uh, counterpart. If you were to leverage Power over Ethernet for every device that I'm aware of, um, you would pick up uh, about 169 low voltage drops per 10,000 square feet of construction, which results in about $126,750 in capital cost savings. Because remember, every time you leverage low voltage, you're removing line voltage or AC, as well as in most cases, a communication cable. That's $1.2675 million per 100,000 square feet of construction. So to sum it up, when we have our closed systems, we don't have the integrated uh, building, it costs more. It costs more to procure, it costs more to deploy, and it costs more to operate. Having open systems gives us incredible day one savings as well as ongoing savings in the building. Uh, we can minima minimize our installation costs. Commissioning is much quicker. We can even do things like constant commissioning. Uh, measurements and verifications to confirm the savings uh, is much easier and more accurate. Uh, lower labor costs, less overlap in the trades. Uh, we can also maximize manufacturer design through prefabrication capabilities. Uh, and the bottom line is we're maximizing your building performance for the life of your building, the total cost of ownership here, right through construction, uh, through the operations phase. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to, uh, to Harry. Thank you. Thank you. So we will take questions at the end of this, and uh, Bob has certainly given us a stimulus, uh, stimulating uh, conversation to think about. And let's look at the benefits of some of this. You know, we talk about the intelligent building, we talk about the uh, <clears throat> card access integrated into the building system so that when an employee walks into the building, the door opens for them. As they're walking through the hallway, their cubicle comes up to a temperature that's appropriate for their area. The lights come on. Uh, their their computer comes on. Um, you know, it's sort of space age. Uh, being 115 years old, I, I go back to the Jetsons and think about the things that we taught. You know, that happened where the vacuum cleaner automatically comes out and things like that. But the reality is, is that this stuff exists today. And one of the sad things that I'd like to point out is that we don't adopt it fast enough. We are reticent to pick up on the savings that are available for our companies. We're reticent to adopt new technology. Um, and that's part of the problem in the industry. You know, we talk about the silos. The construction industry is one of the most siloed industries there that exists. And how do we, in, as individuals, help change that, right? Smart buildings make a lot of sense. They make dollars, dollar, you know, the savings types of sense. Smart buildings equate to smart data. When your, when your systems are all tied together, you can start looking at intelligent data for the entire facility or multiple facilities, right? And we have actionable alarms. And those actionable alarms give us actionable intelligence, as Bob said. Um, how many times have we called a, a service contractor only to find out that it was something simple, you know, a, a parameter was set wrong in the building system or something something simple occurred. Or more importantly, that the building isn't functioning well, right, because the systems aren't integrated. Um, we look at the, the benefits of integration. We look at the benefits of integrating to maintenance software and the return on investment is a huge uh, return for most organizations. The data today goes to the cloud. And we talk about moving data to the cloud, and people worry about things like, uh, well, our IT people don't like that. They want it all in the building. or uh, we can't have our data in the cloud because it's not secure, or we're concerned about uptime. Those are all valid concerns, but the technology today allows quality 
security, it allows uptime, and it allows your uh, data to be available anywhere in the world with the proper security access. Today, people need the ability to do their job wherever they happen to be. Uh, with multiple facilities under your responsibility, potentially you're on a plane and you have to reset parameters on a building uh, control system. Uh, and you can do it, right? You don't have to be sitting in the facility anymore. Moving your data to the cloud helps access. IT, a lot of IT organizations try to protect their turf, okay? Um, this is a people issue. It's a, it's a uh, cultural issue that needs to be overcome. Just like the siloing of con the construction industry, it's a, it's a cultural thing. We need to accept change. We need to address change. And we need to look at the technology that's available to be able to best serve and compete on a global basis. One of the things that you want to look at is your return on investment, okay? We need to explore the technologies because as Bob said in his presentation, one of the things that he can prove right up front in a retrofit or new construction is the cost savings that you're going to incur, right? And if you don't believe the numbers, um, let your CFO look at them, right? Because they're, they're going to give it great scrutiny. The numbers that are put in place are, don't lie. It's as simple as if you walk through and count the number of lights in the building and look at the wattage per bulb that, that the lights are sucking and then convert it to LED and know what watts that would, would, would utilize. You're able to calculate accurately based on the number of fixtures, the number of bulbs, uh, the new cost, the cost of installation. All of those things are believable. Well, the same thing is true taking the approach that Bob's presenting here. But we can't be afraid to do it. Yes, it takes time. Yes, we have to sell it. But that's part of our job in maintenance and, and, and uh, operations. So we need to be able to take time, look at the investment, look at the technologies. You know, we've got CABA uh, with its resources. We've got IFMA coming up uh, in, in Chicago. There's going to be a ton of new technology. And if you don't take the time to look at it and explore it, you're not doing yourself or your company any justice. Maintenance software, you know, one of the technologies that's, that's come into the in implementation of maintenance software is the um, process of COBE, capital C-O-B-I-E. And we're able to take that and look at it as a lean process where during the construction process, instead of everybody uh, checking off and doing their own thing and keeping information siloed, the COBE process shares information and collects it throughout the entire implementation process or construction process. Again, it's a responsibility to help the C-level people get introduced to these processes, these technologies, so they can take advantage of them and you, your organizations can become more cost competitive. Smart buildings, again, equal smart data. Smart buildings make smart return on investment for organizations. And it's up to us as individuals uh, to learn, to take the time to investigate, to do the calculations, to work with organizations like CABA and um, to get the information that you need to improve your operations on a day-to-day -day basis. At this time, um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. And I have a question for Bob. Uh, Bob, 
in terms of smart data, what have you have you seen any uh, specifics that have helped your clients uh, to date that you could share with us? Yeah, the best specifics I can give you on that is uh, really thinking about what you need for an outcome of your building during that early design phase. Uh, because when it comes to data, it really has to do with normalizing that data and being able to understand how it interacts with all the different systems. So if you don't lay that design criteria, uh, which all your specifications will be based on moving forward, then you'll put yourself in a position of bad data. And as we all know, you know, bad data in, bad data out, and that results in um, bad analytics and bad decision making. So uh, that's really what it boils down to. And what I think is very interesting about both of our messages is that we're really not asking the customer to do anything differently when they build their building. We're just asking them to think about how they're going to do that differently. Again, specifying uh, slightly differently and making sure they're open protocol and so on so that the analytics can take over and optimize their buildings. Very good. I, I think that's a, it's it's a very important message, and I think it's one that we don't you know we don't have a lot of time. Our our facility people are consumed in day to day operations, and it's asking a lot to take a step back and actually investigate and take the time to learn about these new technologies. Um, and and of course, integration of maintenance management via BACnet, picking up all the data, being able to uh, put actionable information in place for the people to uh, operate more effectively on a day-to-day -day basis is something that both of our organizations help accomplish. Uh, are there I questions? have a question for you, or I'd like your commentary on something here. Um, I've noticed a big change in uh, the way that uh, facilities administrators are actually setting up maintenance cycles based on the technology that you're talking about here, the analytical technology. And the example I like to use is that um, we're used to being an in an environment where we change our filters every six months, 12 months, whatever that number may be, whether they need it or not. And now I see data affecting the way that we do that where, you know, some of our rooftop units can probably go 18 months and some really need it in three or four months, so we're doing more need-based maintenance rather than calendar-based maintenance. Can you comment on that and how, how you're changing the way people think about running the buildings? Yes, absolutely. Um, that, that's one of the key components of integrating your maintenance software into the building intelligence system, right? Um, you can get sensor data. You can, if you do have a clogged filter, of course, you, you're wasting energy and you're not getting quality air, et cetera, um, and, and that's easy to detect. But what you don't detect is, is other conditions. And we, tying into multiple sensor objects, can make better decisions on how to trigger work orders, how to uh, complete that maintenance, and the frequency of the maintenance that's required. Um, you know, and, and, and that's, that's a really key point, and I appreciate you bringing that up. We have a question here from one of the attendees asking, is there any specs about the integration between systems? Is there any specs? Um, the, the protocols that are, are available today, you know, through the building management system and, and everything all fall down to a, a basic uh, BACnet protocol is, is, is one of the communication protocols. But there are, you know, even if BACnet's not available, there are protocol converters where we can bring together uh, systems and, and bring that data together in a common communication protocol. Uh, She's using the example as integrating metrics between the system. Integrating metrics. Okay. Well, that gets into... Uh, another component which is the the building intelligence component and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit in our next session but building analytics building building intelligence uh, comes from the analytical component and uh, there are a number of, of products that 
Eagle integrates with our Proteus MMX uh, to build, uh, bring building analytic data together into the network in addition to the sensor objects, etc. So um, that's, that's something we can cover in our next session. I have a project where there are two existing buildings and one new. Total about 100k square meters. The BIS is back next. The rest is a combo of standalone lighting, fire alarm, IT, etc. How to approach having all in one data flow? Sorry, um, when specifying a new CMMS for all three. Bob, bringing together from a, a cabling standpoint, do you want to address that? Yeah, absolutely. So, what I the way I I see this uh, type of scenario is, um, you have the opportunity to start with a blank canvas in that new building, because essentially what you're going to do is you're going to design that new building in a way that's going to support all the systems within that building through a unified cable infrastructure, through common protocols, through an integration platform, and through a, a CMMS. That is a cost associated with the new building that will lower your cost to build it. And then once that platform is in place, now you can make a business decision on the value of bringing in those other buildings. And Harry alluded to it before. There's going to be some tra uh, translation issues that go on there that do uh, that will have a cost associated with that. But you have the base system included in that new build, which will save a ton of money uh, in bringing in those older buildings. I'll point out that the cost of protocol converters has dropped drastically and that bringing data into a single subnet, um, there, a lot of the integrators in the, in the industry are, are very capable of doing that. So that's something that, again, exploration, uh, new technology, uh, it, it, it exists. You know, while we're waiting for uh, for some more questions, uh, Harry, do you think it might be a, a good idea to kind of touch on constant commissioning and, and what benefits that might have to a building? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. So one of the benefits to the analytics is what's called constant commissioning. And when you deploy a building before the keys are turned over, you go through a commissioning process. And that, that process basically ensures that all the systems and devices in that building are operating as specified when the building was designed. The problem with buildings are, like most things, as you use them, you tend to drift. It's kind of like the alignment in your car. As soon as you pull off of a new car lot, your al alignment starts to drift out of whack. And at some point, you start to suffer on your fuel uh, energy consumption. You suffer on your tires. They wear quicker until you get a new alignment. And then everything is back to being optimal performance. Through the analytical software, we can do what's called constant commissioning that periodically looks at all of the devices and systems within your building and recommissions them, re-ensures that they're opti operating at their, uh, as they were initially specified to operate, giving you the optimum performance throughout the life of that building. Very good point. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of companies build new buildings and don't take the time to even begin. The, they, they cut the cost and don't do the commissioning which leads to more problems down the road. Uh, and premature but, wear on systems, absolutely. Right. So, you know, having, a, having integrated systems, uh, bringing you live data in real time, uh, along with building intelligence, is definitely something that's going to pay off in the long run for your organization. I think that sort of sums up the session today. Uh, if any of you have any questions that you want to get in touch with Bob or myself, uh, please feel free to contact us directly. Um, both of our con all of our contact information is up on the screen right now. Um, we can work one on one with anybody. We'd be happy to. Uh, answer any questions and we appreciate your time very much for today. Bob, I want to thank you for your time. 
Thank you for the invitation. And I noticed someone had asked if we're available for in-house presentations. Uh, and certainly, uh, I'd be more than happy to collaborate with Harry on a, an in-house presentation for anyone or anyone's customers to talk about this uh, this methodology. Absolutely. And uh, again, we appreciate all of your time. Uh, it's a good step in learning about what is new in the industry and how it can help you as a facility operations manager. Uh, help your organizations become more intelligent and uh, more competitive in today's marketplace. Before we drop off, there was one question that just came in that I think might be worth a minute to answer. And it was uh, the, uh, one of uh, the listeners here struggles with the uh, realization of savings on ongoing or going with PoE. While you may save on cable runs, the cost of your capacity on your network switches increases. And certainly, the power capacity is still needed to power the switches. Um, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is you can actually, it is less expensive to deploy PoE than it is to uh, deploy line voltage, especially when you consider there may be two infrastructures to support an edge device. Um, <clears throat> I can't speak for all manufacturers, but I'm very familiar with the Cisco products, and they have a specific switch that's called the Cisco Digital Building Switch, designed specifically to support low voltage lighting systems, IoT, and intelligent building environments. The cost per port on that is very low, and it has the ability to push out about 60 watts of power per port to an edge device. So we're able to support larger devices like 2x4 lights, uh, high power cameras, things of that nature. Uh, and when we look at that at holistically, it is a, a lower cost um, to deploy using PoE rather than your traditional uh, line voltage. Okay, um, I think we'll wrap the session up. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Harry, for your time. Just a reminder for all the attendees, we will be sending out an email that contains the link to access this recording of this webinar. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to email us and ask any other questions, or if you even want to make suggestions for next webinars, feel free to email us at webinars at eaglesmms.com and visit our site at eaglesmms.com. We will um, send you more information as the day goes by, and thank you very much for your time.